Hello and welcome to Technology Update. Much as Christopher Columbus served the Queen and King of Spain by pushing the boundaries of the known world, we too have come to Barcelona to serve you. While the team and I may not have discovered uncharted lands, we have found a handful of innovations that stretch the limits of mobile technology. It's that time of year again when the whole mobile community descends on the Catalonian capital. While the annual gathering has been happening for more than a quarter century, organizers build this Mobile World Congress as bigger and better than ever. Having moved into a newer and more spacious center, it's the one-stop shop for just about everything in personal-sized tech. With one fruit-shaped exception, all the industry's big players were there, each hoping to ooh and ah investors and gadget gurus alike. So with Apple staying away as it traditionally does, Samsung was able to bask in the knowledge that it was far and away the biggest fish in the pond. With an eye on keeping its share of the Android-based Pi, the Note 8.0 made its big debut and got the blogosphere a buzzing. But it's going to have to work hard to fight off challenges from both new and old competitors. Nokia was also on hand to tout its latest row of smartphones. The company looked to brush off bearish attitudes about its future with no less than four new handsets. At their stand, we got ours on a higher end Lumina and checked out their tech that can wipe out unwanted photo bombers as well as give a little extra surprise to your shots with localized animation. Then there was LG, the South Korea high tech hub. Like many others, they've got their fingers in all kinds of electronic pies, but they're looking to make inroads with the latest line of their Optimus L series, one model of which was made available to Russian users before anywhere else. Its dual SIM capability allows seamless switching between carriers. Whether it's an extra phone for their pocket-sized arsenal or an extra hand for a beautiful woman, people are always looking for something more. And there's one Russian company that's found an interesting way to give people the most bang for their buck. That firm was Yoda Devices, who in the absence of any truly groundbreaking announcements from the globe's habitual headline makers, stole a sliver of the spotlight with a rather unconventional handset offering. Transitioning from its comfort zone of LTE-enabled routers and modems, this plucky Russian company is hoping to carve out a niche for itself in the congested smartphone market. Now, its 4G modem hardware already accounts for some 6% worldwide. But in Barcelona, visitors flock to their stand to catch their first glimpse of what will be the Yoda phone. In addition to an LCD screen on the front, it's fitted out with an extra e-ink display on the back. But what's a second screen good for? Well, let's say you're in a foreign city. I don't know, Barcelona, for example. You've got loads of things to do and see, but you don't really know your way around. You're going to need a map. And constant glancing at your LCD screen can drain your battery more quickly than you might expect. Simply swipe the needed map to the energy-efficient backside, and you'll find your way without losing so much juice. And if you've realized a little too late that your battery's about to conk out, you don't have to worry about losing your bearings, since once it's there, it doesn't use any extra power to keep it in place. That way, you can make your way to Sagrada Familia with hardly a hiccup. Once there, you can use the e-ink screen to brush up on the building's history and its ridiculously long construction process. Now, Yodaphone also aims to make reading on your celly a little more convenient as well. Forget bulky newspapers. Heck, forget about an additional e-reader. Fitted with swipe-enabled sensors down at the bottom, you'll be ready for hours of glare-free reading under that sweet Spanish sun. And lastly, got an important document that you just can't afford to lose because of a fatigued phone? Whether it be a boarding pass, shopping list, or simple coupon, Yoda's second screen has got you covered, making sure you don't miss your flight or your morning cup of joe. To bring the phone to life, Yoda turned to Qualcomm, whose Snapdragon S4 processor lies at the heart of the Yoda phone prototype. Its 23 nanometer technology is designed to meet the demands of multitasking phones and tablets. Regardless of what you use your handheld device for, Qualcomm is quite confident that they've got just what modern users demand. It's capable of handling hours and hours of hassle-free gaming, as this all-day and all-night marathon showed. It's also got the quickness to offer screen responsiveness second to none. And all of that comes in a thoroughly efficient setup that merely simmers while the others boil. In our opinion, Qualcomm is one step ahead of all the other companies that produce chipsets. 
and that's in terms of power consumption, the support of LTE frequency bands, the size of the chipset, and many other parameters. But existing cooperation wasn't the only thing on Yoda and Qualcomm execs' lips in Barcelona. During a high-powered visit from CEO Paul Jacobs, the two innovative companies announced a major step forward. Yoda became the first Russian firm to sign what's called an SDK licensing agreement with Qualcomm. Getting their hands on the proprietary kit will enable developers to push the capabilities of the Yoda phone to the limit. We are receiving access to the original source code and design of the chipset. So we can refine the device further in terms of energy use as well as the data processing rate. Moreover, we'll have direct technical support from Qualcomm. That'll allow Yoda to fully customize its software and hardware around the Snapdragon processor. And at Mobile World Congress, there were numerous vivid examples of just what's possible with Qualcomm tech. For example, this photo booth was developed on the basis of the company's Dragon Board, which is itself based on the same kind of chips used by Yoda. From fun, relatively simple things like playing around with your friends' photos, to high-tech innovations, such boards are often ideal for developers building and optimizing projects that don't require everything to be pint-sized. So with that, Yoda hopes to join the plethora of other handset makers out there running Qualcomm chips and should help them compete with the creme de la creme. Yoda plans to pit its two-sided smartphone against the industry's top dogs. In order to do that, they need to show potential customers and operators just what they're capable of. And in that regard, the few days at Mobile World Congress was time well spent. Everything went really well. People showed genuine interest in and excitement about the new product. It speaks volumes that leading analysts and major mass media outlets called it the only true innovative device at Mobile World Congress. Only time will tell if it's a true game changer, but we should find out soon enough with a Yoda phone supposedly set for release in the second half of 2013. Once upon a time, letters were the most convenient way for people to stay in touch. However, the heyday of the Pony Express and snail mail have long since passed us by. Nowadays, comms consumers don't just demand instant access, but connection quality on par with the real thing. Over the years, there have been many ways to get your point across, but they've all been leading to where we are now. For centuries, the top spot was held by good old pen and paper. At the time, that seemed to suit most people's needs decently well. But of course, the required middlemen, starting from the initial sorting, to transportation, to sorting again, and then delivery, slowed things down more than most would have liked. And as technology improved, it allowed newer, faster ways for people to exchange salutations and ideas. Instantaneous back and forth totally revolutionized communication, but soon gave way to the desire to see who you're talking with. That led to the first video phones back in the 1960s and 70s. At the time, the tech was just too expensive. That's all changed with the rise of the internet, which isn't without its own problems. At its simplest, digital IP communication is quite straightforward. A wideband channel connects you directly to your fellow Gabber located nearby. But in the real world, you're more likely many miles apart and you share the various network paths with millions of others. And with more people streaming more data, routes get clogged and disruptions impede communication. To help minimize such issues, voice and video data get chopped up into individual packets and sent separately through various channels, hopefully avoiding major traffic jams along the way. But the digital setup certainly isn't without its hiccups. Sometimes the separate packets don't arrive on time or even in the proper order, resulting in choppy speech. Jitter buffers can sort this out, delivering the data just as the speaker intended. And when some packets of data get lost en route, concealment algorithms are required to fill in the missing syllables. And when you're talking with video, even the slightest dissonance between sound and picture can throw anyone off their game. Now, trying to troubleshoot all these problems in real time demands serious processing power to say the least. That means an extra control module is needed to ensure the best quality without overloading the CPU. Complex mathematics and algorithms known as voice and video engines are what have made that all possible. And one of the global leaders is Spirit DSP. If you've made a phone call or had a video chat over the internet, chances are that you've used Team Spirit's engines. 
And despite increasing strains on network capacity, Spirit still makes sure you come in loud and clear. Here we are, showing demo video conferences held with our offices, including in Moscow, which is thousands of miles away from here. It's all in HD, but all we need is just an ordinary laptop and an ordinary internet connection, even when the network is really overloaded like it is here. And it's with precisely such video conferencing software that the company has made its latest mark in the industry. By giving telecoms companies the ability to offer unmatched over IP software and video conferencing to their clients, Spirit feels that traditional operators may be able to stop some of the bleeding initiated by over-the-top services like Viber and Skype. The latest version of their video most can turn roundtable discussions into round-the-world conferences. While there may be some pretenders to the throne out there, the guys at Spirit are confident they've got the upper hand. Our technology allows for as many as 50 simultaneous audio and video streams in one video conference. Other leading companies in this sphere usually only have up to nine interactive streams. Such connectivity capability is needed here at Russian Railways Station Monitoring Office. With 6,000 safety cameras streaming real-time pics of the situation on and around the tracks from stations all over Russia, Spirit's Video Most integrates the constant tide of video coming at those here in Moscow. The software can also be adapted to enable more effective exchange of info with those on the scene and can even let reps from government agencies in on the chat if need be, all with the aim of boosting safety and response efficiency. The work takes place on a server, which means that the server itself processes all of the video streams. It's a very resource-intensive process, but despite that, our server is what we call light, in the sense that a large number of simultaneous video streams are processed using relatively cheap hardware. For comparison, a Huawei video server that processes a thousand video streams costs about half a million dollars. However, with our software, the same number of streams can be processed on a server that costs only $5,000. Such big cost savings can turn into huge ones for companies like Rostelecom. With nearly 50 million subscribers nationwide, the Russian telecoms giant turned to Spirit, whose video must is helping traditional connection companies go digital at a fraction of the cost. A part of that is this federal project called Electronic Government, which allows people to get answers and even apply for services via video-connected terminals. When execs were searching for the right software setup at the call center, there was really only one option. There was practically nobody that could offer an out-of-the-box solution, meaning one that was ready to go immediately after installation with minimum modification. The only company that was able to provide this was Spirit DSP's Videomost. Wealthy British scion Zach Wells and investment activist Markets, finance, scandal. Find out what's really happening to the global economy with Max Kaiser for a no-holds-barred look at the global financial headlines. Tune in to Kaiser Report on RT. When their own country can't offer them a living, even loving mothers sometimes have to leave their children behind. I'd like to work just a bit longer. It's the dream of millions of migrants that their children might choose their own motherland. I was born in Tajikistan. I live in Moscow. Uh, my dream is live in America. 
I want my children to win over Moscow. Russia has become their step motherland. RT meets migrants working hard to find a way home. Choose your language. Good morning for me, Kevin Owen. If you've been here, choose the news that concerns you. Choose the opinions that invigorate your mind. Choose the stories that impact your life. Choose the access to your RT. Welcome back to Technology Update in the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. There's so much to do and see in the action-packed four days that people are constantly on the move to make sure they don't miss tomorrow's next headline. Yes, it's easy to get caught up in the bright lights and fancy displays, but in reality, many were in town to hammer out agreements and ink important deals. In the news around the time was Vimpocom. At this point, it's a truly international brand with operators in around 20 countries. Inside Russia, however, the company is best known for its Beeline brand, who recently announced that they'd pinned a deal with China Mobile. The agreement will give their subscribers the ability to reach all numbers in China directly without having their calls routed through a transit network operator. But they weren't the only ones looking to make a little news at Barcelona. There was also Switzerland-based but Russia-centric SPB-TV. Drawing on the wealth of IT know-how in Russia's northern capital, the company got its start in the late 1990s as SPB Software House. A few years back, the TV-focused department was spun off as a separate business. At past gatherings here, the company found its first super-sized client and hopes to continue its luck with new hardware and advertising options that has benefits for just about everyone under the sun. We brought in new uh, hardware, uh, streamer and transcoders, um, which are unique in this kind of space. Uh, we have uh, um, an entire end-to-end -end solution, one of the technology our customers like most, to see how we exchange advertisement, we replace existing advertisement in a continuous stream with local advertisement, which is better to monetize. And this is good for the customer because everyone gets more money, and for the user who watch the TV, which is because the local advertisement is more meaningful for everyone. Not one to be left out of the fun, Russia's reigning high-tech champ Yandex was in Barcelona to continue their push for an alternative mobile ecosystem. They announced a new version of their 3D interface, as well as officially opened Yandex Store. But first, they had to figure out how to attract developers before they built up users, as well as how to attract users without newly developed apps. We solved the problem of the chicken and egg by purchasing licenses from some applications from Opera. Opera is a well-known player on this market, so we're not starting from scratch, which would have been insanely difficult. We've already got quite a few applications to offer. However, this wasn't the first time Yandex has turned to the Norwegian firm for cooperation. Opera had previously provided its traffic-compressing turbocharger for Yandex browser last year. So with already around 50,000 apps ready for download, Yandex is prepped to offer its biggest rival a little friendly competition. Although Android is a de facto open platform, there's no viable competition. No other companies that can match, for example, Google Play. It's in our company's DNA to offer an alternative. We have a search engine, a mail service, a popular cloud service. We have maps. So we decided to offer an alternative, which will be a good thing. Times certainly have changed for old school games like this. With every day, physical toy makers are being squeezed out by the processing power of computers. Technology now in the palm of your hands is beefy enough to deliver killer graphics and flawless gameplay. In fact, you can now turn your smartphone into both game console and controller instantaneously. But in recent years, much of the hubbub in the industry hasn't been about super shiny hardcore games, but the much more relaxed and family-friendly casual ones. And one of the heavy hitters in this sphere is Game Insight. Founded only three years ago, it's made its way to the top of the industry's elite, with the likes of Airport City, 
which was among the top grossing Android apps for a time last year. Game Insight furthered its winning streak with Paradise Island, which was reportedly the company's top performer on Google-powered devices at the beginning of 2013. However, the company's go-to game has been Mystery Manor, which clocked in as the number nine top grossing game over 2012. All told, it's taken in more than $40 million, and the company was rated as one of the top 20 publishers on Google Play. And just as you'd expect, they too were on hand in Barcelona to give visitors a new way to see and experience their games. Take a peek inside and you were treated to a 3D version of one of their fan favorites. And their stand itself also won over a few critics. It got a shout out as one of the top exhibits in Barcelona on PCMag.com. Now there are many ways to make it big, but top execs think they found a model that gives the best of both worlds. All games from Game Insight are totally free, so that you can play any games as much as you want free of charge. But if you are looking for additional features, like slightly improving your weapons or, say, expanding the territory, or just boosting your energy levels so that you can play more actively, then you can pay a small amount of money to do that and have even more fun playing. That's the only business model Game Insight uses. Spread out across the globe from San Francisco to Moscow, the company has more than 500 minds behind that idea. And here at the main Russian HQ, producers, artists and programmers are working on what they hope to be the company's next big hit. The majority of their offerings are strategic builder games, which remind old timers like me of the SimCity series from my childhood. It may not be the first thing that pops to mind right away, but putting together relatively casual games like these demand far more time and effort than one might expect. And the right balance between difficulty and entertainment is the hallmark of a successful game. Despite being so young, the company boasts more than 140 million users worldwide, which means roughly one in 10 smartphone handlers is killing some time on a Game Insight game. In 2012 alone, the company estimates that players spent over 18,000 years combined glued to their screens. And with revenues doubling every year, the company looks to keep its early successes rolling forward. But such achievements and concomitant profits aren't the only thing the company has managed to generate. The creative juices at Game & Sight have given birth to another web-centric startup. Nestled right next to one another in Barcelona, Nerit takes a traditional pastime and gives it a digital twist. While the underlying idea of their comics and books remains mostly the same, the way users take them in is undergoing a major shift. With people nowadays never too far away from their smartphones or tablets, traditional content makers have a unique opportunity to deploy technology to their benefit. As I just alluded to, the idea didn't come out of thin air, but was nurtured along by those with earlier success. It was the head of Game Insight, Elisa Chumachenka, who came up with this idea. Our companies are really close. In fact, our offices are all in the same building, just a couple of floors apart. One day, Elisa and the other two co-founders of our company were discussing plans for the future and came up with the idea to go into interactive content. We know how to create great games, so let's try something new. We caught up with the team at their Moscow office to see just what's possible and how it could be changing how many people interact with traditional forms of media. Now, they're not trying to totally reinvent the wheel here. What they are attempting, however, is to incorporate new ways to keep people engaged in a distraction-filled world. Take Motion Comics, for example, one of Narrate's main focuses. Once upon a time, graphic novels and comic books were the best middle ground between traditional text and film. But now with so many people packing portable tablets these days, motion comics nudge the genre a little closer to film or cartoons. The style and storytelling of graphic novels remain, but with just the right amount of action thrown in. To create the content for these motion comics, Narrate has called in the services of some of Russia's top sci-fi authors, giving them a chance to see their stories come to life before their very eyes as well. Then there are so-called interactive books, which is a pendulum swing in the other direction. More similar to traditional text, but still with a little something extra to keep readers tuned in, I could easily see this as the perfect format for books, whose storyline changes based on the reader's decisions and choices along the way. With an eye on a wide international audience, Narrate's novels can be found in four languages, Russian, English, Spanish, and Korean. 
Then there's Narrate's nonfiction department, which concentrates its efforts on making learning more interesting and understandable. Here, the target audience isn't just school kids that need a little extra push to hit the books. In fact, much of the material could be of serious interest to ever curious adults. Imagine combining an explanatory video clip along with a science or history lesson, or perhaps a fun game or activity to reinforce whatever the reader just took in. With its growing audience and the demands for new content that brings with it, the guys here at Narrate have a very different environment from traditional publishers. It's a lot like a TV channel. We have a schedule over there so everyone can see when episodes are due to be uploaded to the platform and know their deadlines two months beforehand. From start to finish, it's a pretty labor-intensive operation. After storyboards, each scene has to be drawn by hand, which these days is of course all digital, but every line and shadow is the result of a carefully placed pin stroke. Once they have the completed drawings, the next step is to give them life and put motion and emotion behind the text. What do we mean by editing program? Ours is web-oriented. You can import stuff from a lot of different sources, like Adobe After Effects, for example. So we take these frames and import them directly to our HTML editor, which we then use to put together an interactive episode. Then the episode is uploaded to the Narrate platform. You can access the completed editions via their apps for Android and iOS devices. But if you're looking for something more and think you've got what it takes, soon anyone will have the chance to publish and potentially sell their own interactive content via Narrate's platform. If someone wants to create his or her own interactive book, they go to the website and add a page like I'm doing right here. They then choose the genre and a design template from the ones we have available. Then you choose the audio files and the interactive elements that will be added to the page with a simple click of the mouse. Then you click publish and the book goes to one of our reviewers who looks at it and if it's consistent with our rules it gets published. So will this lead to a wider revolution in terms of book publishing as a whole? It's tough to say at the moment, but the future of print-based media is certainly a topic that's up for discussion. And at the very least, recent technological advances mark the biggest change and perhaps challenge since the time of Johannes Gutenberg. In my opinion, the prevalence of traditional printed books will decline significantly in the near future. Of course, they won't disappear completely. I mean, they will be in libraries and museums for years to come. But it won't be like it was, say, 20 years ago. We didn't have the chance, but if we surveyed those at Mobile World Congress, there would likely be more than a handful of mobile maniacs that foresee the end of paper books as we know it. But after four hectic days filled with gadgets and software solutions, people in the exhibition hall started packing up and buzzing towards the exits. As you can see, the festivities here in Barcelona are coming to a close. Fortunately, though, with the devices and innovations you've seen today, we're more than mobile enough to make it back to Moscow. So we'll see you next time, and until then, enjoy the ride.